today, this is our last week in the book of Acts. Um, this has been, you know, as we were just talking, this has been a really fun way to go through Acts. I've learned a lot. I've been enjoying kind of framing the question around how does Acts show us what, um, what the changes and challenges were like for the early church as it was being formed into a new community of Christ. Um, you know, they left things behind. They, they took things from their past along with them, but they left things behind and they, they moved into a new way of being community. And so today we are going to look at vocation, mostly Acts chapter 28, Paul's imprisonment in Rome, vocation, um, what it is that God calls us to do. And this week with vocation is going to be the start of the next three weeks in this time. We're going to, um, ooh, we're going to do a movie watching next week. And then for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about vocation at St. Paul's. You know, this is a time for us of transition and, and great reset in some ways. You know, we don't know exactly what things are going to look like in six months or a year. We know they'll be wonderful and we know they'll be different in some ways and the same in some ways. And, um, and so over the next three weeks, we'll take some time to do our own visioning about that, which is something I love doing with you. This church, I just think you all vision like, like nobody else I know. So this mosaic here that we're looking at is very, very old. It is one of the oldest images found of St. Paul, 1600 years old. It is, it was found outside the walls of Rome at a basilica. Um, I can't remember the name of it. We could Google it and find out. Um, but this is said to be where Paul was buried. And so this is an old, old okay. image of him. And I just thought it was cool and wanted to share it with you. Isn't it interesting that we always get the image of Paul as bald, um, kind of big foreheaded, not very attractive. We get the description in the scriptures of him being kind of bandy legged, you know, kind of short and, um, you know, his legs were all crazy and knobby. And his, of course, by the time he got through his ministry, his body was pretty well worn out from all the beating up he had taken. But Here's Paul. So we got at the very beginning of the book of Acts, God set his brand new church on their task, gave them vocation for the Christian church. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this is all the way back in the first chapter of Acts. So you see in this map, we have Jerusalem as the center of these kind of oblong uh, circles. So the church started in Jerusalem with the small group of disciples who were tucked away in the upper room. And um, not by their own choice, but through persecution, they got sent out to Judea and Samaria, where they witnessed to the good news of the gospel. And then various missionaries, but mostly Paul, went on over the next 20, 30 years to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to all of the known Western world. And so this, um, this light green line you see is the, the area that under Paul's ministry, Christianity became an influence in. And of course, we know that by 325 AD or so, Christianity had become the religion, the faith of the entire Roman Empire. So from, from 33 AD to 300 some AD, those 300 years, um, the Christian faith grew from several hundred people to something like 35 million people, which is extraordinary. You know, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And generally not because they wanted to be, but because God sent them out through the pressures of their lives. So 
resetting vocation. I wanted to look at this topic, um, not chronologically through scripture, but just by topic. So um, there, are, there are factors that help us with our vocation. The role of serendipity, um, of coincidence, of things happening that we happen to be there. I know that we can all look back on our lives and think, wow, my, my life, my career, my work would be very different if it hadn't have been for this moment of serendipity for this person I met for this situation that I was in. The role of showing up, just you know, being present, being ready to do the work at hand and being willing to do the work at hand, whatever it is. The role of community, none of us, including Paul, are able to do our work, our vocation, our ministry by ourselves, but we're supported by community, we're directed by community. Consistency, something that we see in Paul that's a, a great source of his integrity is that throughout his ministry, he, um, he engages the Jewish community and Gentile communities in consistent ways. That's not to say that it's always exactly the same because he also realizes he's in different contexts in each city that he's in, but he's consistent in his methodology, which at the end, as we'll see in Rome, is a great gift to him as he talks with the Jewish community in Rome. Failure. Um, you know, failure is an underrated gift. We hate it when we fail. We hate it when the things that we do fail, and yet our failures are so often um, not only ways that we learn, but ways that new doors get opened or new opportunities come before us or we go in new directions that we wouldn't have thought to do otherwise. And finally, God's grace. You know, as we look at Paul's life, without God's grace, he just would have kind of been bumping all around cities in the, in the Roman Empire and, and not much would have happened except, you know, he had a lot of misadventures. But with God's grace, all those misadventures added up into a missionary ministry which changed the lives of millions and millions of people. So serendipity. I love this image, a postage stamp from Malta. This is an image of Paul who's standing there on the water with his halo and the story in Acts chapter 27 about the shipwreck. So all of the sailors there are in the water um, and Paul promised them that none of them would perish, and indeed none of them did perish. So two stories I was thinking about that, that show us the serendipity of Paul's ministry, and I'm going to ask you if you have other ideas, too, of um, examples of serendipity, but two stories I was thinking about. At the end of chapter 27 in Acts, in the beginning of chapter 28, there's a shipwreck and then a snake bite. So at the end of Acts chapter 27, beginning at verse 39, um, well, beginning at verse 13 in chapter 27, they've, Paul and his companions have been on a ship that is sailing during the wintertime, during the bad time for sailing, and they've gotten into storms. And so they weighed anchor and they sailed along the, the edge of Crete. Um, which is an island. They sailed close to the shore. They thought that the weather would be good enough for them to do that. Um, and the, the winds picked up. And so they sailed under the lee of a small island called Cauda, and they managed to secure the boat. But then a big storm came and started, you know, just sending the boat hither and thither, and, um, and they threw all their tackle over, and they threw most of their food and most of their water over just trying to save the boat and save themselves. And the storm went on for 14 days. And so after the 14th night, Paul said to everybody, you know, have some food, have a drink, because an angel has come to me and promised that even though the ship will not be saved, every one of us will be saved. And so they had some food and they had some drink and the ship broke apart and they all washed up on shore in Malta. This story, as Luke 
tells it, as Luke structures the book of Acts, is meant to be the, the very central um, action of the book of Acts. It's the climax of the book of Acts because what it does is it harkens back to the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. This is Paul's story of death and resurrection. And so within the story of the shipwreck, Paul's near death, the, the coming of the angel, um, in verse 33, we get this idea of the Last Supper. Listen to this. They're still on the boat. They haven't abandoned ship yet. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food and have taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And then listen to these words that are like the Last Supper. When he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. And they were all encouraged and ate some food for themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship. They threw the rest of their food overboard, throwing out the wheat into the sea. The grains of wheat are scattered. Um, I love that image. And so the shipwreck happens, which in this story would be the image of the crucifixion. And they all wash up on the island of Malta. So the resurrection happens. They wash up on Malta. And while they're on the island of Malta, just in that very first day or two, um, some of the locals there find them all shivering in the cold and wet and bring them in and, and light some sticks on fire, set a fire for them. And while they're doing that, uh, a snake comes out of the pile of sticks and it latches on to Paul's hand and bites him. And the people of Malta are like, oh, he must be a thief. So they are passing judgment on Paul and, and looking to see um, the judgment of the gods upon Paul for his, for his criminality. They say, oh, he must be a thief. And they watched him for the next few hours to see if he would puff up and die. And indeed, he did not puff up and die, but he lived on. And so they thought then that he was a god. Um, and the point of the story here is that the people of Malta were looking for justice from the gods. But what Paul experienced was providence and protection from the one true God so that he could go forward into his ministry in Rome, because it was Rome that he was finally destined to go to. It was Caesar that he was finally destined to go to. I wonder what other places of serendipity or coincidence do you think of when you think of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts? I think about all the times that Paul is in jail and he goes before whatever tribunal or whatever government, government official and you know they're about ready to kill him and he says, well, I'm a Roman citizen, so don't kill me. And by the way, here's the good news of Jesus Christ. And they say, well, that's interesting. Let me pass you on up to the next, the next level of government, um, which is how he finally got to Rome, which just seems like such a set of unlikely circumstances. What else do you think of? I just think Paul's life, he must look back and thought that was just one coincidence after another. All right, showing up. Most of Paul's witness is possible simply because he was present and he was ready to speak with boldness. You get this word boldness at the very end of, um, of the book of Acts as Paul is speaking to the Jews. Um, 
here, verse 30, chapter 28. Paul lived two whole years at his own expense in Rome and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And this word boldness is a technical term. It means um, not just that he had moral courage, but that he had a willingness to speak, a readiness to speak in public about important matters. So it wasn't just that he was courageous, but also that as opportunities presented themselves, he was willing to speak up in public. So think about um, back several chapters behind in the book of Acts, Paul is uh, going around looking at the, the temple of Apollo. He's in Corinth. And, um, and he goes, the people of the town start talking to him and he says, I notice you have all these statues to all these gods. And then I notice also that you have this, this statue to the unknown God. Well, I know who that unknown God is. And they say, really? Come talk to us about it. So it was just the next day then that Paul got up in front of the whole town and was able to talk about the gospel, about this God who they know as the unknown God, but he knows as the Lord Jesus Christ and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so he was able to speak boldly, speak out in public on that important matter. And I think, you know, I just think of Paul's entire ministry really being, he gets arrested, he shows up, he's willing to say what needs to be said while, while he's there in front of the group of people. Um, what examples, what other examples of that pattern can you think of? I like where when he's in prison and um, the, the prison doors open and instead of leaving, he stays and he kind of shows up and, and he doesn't leave. He stays mm -hmm. and they all start singing and they're very present um, and he's there for everybody and, you know, he just stays present. Yeah. Everybody expects him to leave. Yeah, yeah takes advantage of the opportunity that's there yeah and witnesses and you know then others who weren't supposed to like go to, with him they all stay yeah well he uh he didn't always show up voluntarily but uh when he was arrested in jerusalem the last time he was arrested in jerusalem he instead of just going into the barracks to be safe he turned around and actually talked to the crowd and uh, told them his story. In fact, he told his story at his conversion, I think, three times in Acts. He was out, and usually before hostile audiences. Uh, yeah. That, that really impresses me. These are people who had his life and death in, his, in their hands, and he, he didn't hold back a bit. That's right. That's right. You know, I, um, I love a good strategic plan. I love to have my list, you know, the next, the next three to five years, we're gonna do this. And these are, the, these are the benchmarks we're gonna reach and this is how we're gonna do it. And Paul kind of had a plan, you know, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go tour, tour the cities of the Roman, the Roman empire. But it seems to me that mostly his ministry, whatever, and a strategic plan he had mostly his ministry was just being obedient to where God had him end up and and showing up and being willing to speak wherever he happened to be. Ah, consistency. Oh, boy, I've, I've clicked a lot of buttons. Community. Um, so here is the map of Paul's travels on this last missionary journey, this last journey as he's going from Jerusalem down in the corner 
Um, you can see there, they set sail, they went along Cyprus um, and then let in at Myra and then the weather turned. And so they tucked in here along the lee side of this little island and they crawled along Crete here, just trying to stay out of the bad winds. It was in Crete where they hung out for the winter and finally they said the weather's good enough Let's keep sailing, which what Paul said, this is a bad choice. Let's not sail yet. The weather's not good enough. Um, but they kept sailing and indeed they found that the weather was not good enough. And here they are going across the Mediterranean Sea for 14 days. They have the shipwreck, finally wash up on Malta. Um, where, you know, they're taken in by the little community there in Malta who, who didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ when Paul and his companions showed up, but they did when they left. From there, they sailed to Syracuse and Regium, where they were met up by some Christians. And then they came up to Pusali, um, where the Christian community there asked them to stay for, and they stayed for a week, you know, just enjoying the hospitality and the company of, of their Christian friends. And you know how it is, wherever you meet Christians around the world, um, you're immediately family of sort. You know, even if you don't know them, often when you show up in a community of Christians, they welcome you in and they, they offer you their hospitality and their friendship. And so Paul spent seven days here in Pusali, and then they came up um, to the three taverns where the Christians in Rome heard that Paul and his companions were coming to Rome. And so they came south out of Rome and they met up with, with Paul there. This is the kind of action that the people of a city would do if an emperor were coming in. They'd all come pouring out of the city, meet the emperor and walk with them for the last leg of their journey. So that's what the, the Christian community in Rome did for Paul. They came out and welcomed him and walked him into the city. And so Paul witnesses within communities. We have very few situations where we see him witnessing just to one person. Um, you know, think about Philip. He's out in the wilderness and he meets the eunuch from Ethiopia. And so Philip had this one-on-one -on -one conversation with with the eunuch in Ethiopia, but we don't really have anything like that in Paul. Paul would go to the Jewish synagogues and he would, he would teach the communities there. He would go to uh, the various churches he would visit to encourage them. And then, um, you know, he would speak in front of governors and rulers in situations of trial. He was always speaking to groups, and he was always being propelled forward by the Christian community who was helping him. Consistency. Paul was consistent in his methodology about how he gathered people and taught, and that gave his ministry integrity, which really helped him at the end. And what I mean by that, when Paul would go into a city he would always go first to the Jewish synagogue. He would always start his teaching there. He would always give the Jewish people the opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ first, before he went to the Gentiles. Um, and then the people who would receive the gospel, they would continue in community with Paul. Most often he was pretty roundly rejected by the synagogue and he would, you know, go next door or go to another house in town and continue teaching to whoever would join him there who were usually a mixture then of Jews and Gentiles. But Paul had this pattern of always going to the Jews first and helping the Jews to understand um, how, how the, the root of, or the, the, the branch of this new faith, this new gospel of Jesus Christ, comes out of the root of Judaism, how the story of Jesus is actually the fulfillment of their story. He would always 
teach that. And as David noted, he gave his, um, he gave his testimony about his own conversion, you know, saying, here's who I am. I grew up in the Jewish faith as a Pharisee to surpass all Pharisees. Um, this is what happened to me on the road of Damascus. And this is why I believe that Jesus Christ is my savior. And so Paul consistently did that. So when he got to Rome, we're in Acts chapter 28 now. Uh, Paul called together the local leaders of the Jews. This is verse 17. Um, after three days, so you know, the first people he met there, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And here Paul is playing a little bit of defense because Paul doesn't know what have the, the Jews in Rome heard about him, what have they heard about the Christian church. He assumes that what they've heard about the Christian church is not good because there was a riot in Rome 10 years prior against the Christians. But he doesn't know what they've heard about him, about Paul. And so he goes to explain to them, every place I've gone, I've gone first to the synagogue, I've, I've talked to the Jews, I've invited them into this new faith, I've never said a bad word against the Jews, although I continually get brought up in, upon charges of saying bad words against the Jews. But I never have. This is my pattern of how I've always carried out my ministry. And the Jews there said, oh, well, we've really not heard of you. And yes, we've heard of the Christian church and we've heard it's bad. And so we're, we're glad to have you, Paul, come and teach us about this church. And we're glad also to know about the integrity of your teaching that you've built up over the years. And so Paul's consistency in his methodology, his consistency in going first to the Jews and proclaiming the same message to them each place he's gone um, helps him, which our consistency in our work and our ministries and our vocations also helps us. It builds trust, it builds integrity. Can you think of other ways that Paul has shown his consistency or the ways that his consistency has, um, has brought blessing, has brought trust and integrity for him? Failure. Vocation. For Paul, for us, is concerned with our faithfulness. I think that's another way that I want to say just showing up, being willing to show up. Um, the results may or may not come as we think that they will. So when Paul was in Rome and he's in front of the Jews in the synagogue, he quotes to them Isaiah chapter 6. This is beginning at verse 26 in Acts chapter 28. I'm giving you a bigger chunk of Isaiah 6. So what I have here is Isaiah 6. Um, you know, the, the temple is filled with smoke. Oh, here, let me, I'm moving your faces around on my screen. <laughs> the seraphs flew to me holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. This is Isaiah's um, vision. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. You would think that when Paul was going to the Jews in Rome that he would have offered this portion of Isaiah's call up, you know, look at me, here I am, send me, this great thing has been done to me. But no, Paul started with this next portion. Go and say to this people, keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop the ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. 
Paul does not offer up the victorious, but rather the failure part of the calling. And, and most often that's what Paul experienced, you know, to eyes other than the eyes of faith, his ministry was just one failure after another, one, one mistake after another, one, one failed plan, one accident after another. And yet that really didn't stop God from doing what God was planning to do. God, in fact, used all of those failures strung together to get Paul exactly where he needed him and doing exactly what he needed him to do. What other examples of Paul's failures or, you know, the inability to accomplish what he set out to accomplish? What else do you think of that we would look at and say, doesn't look like it's going so well for Paul? This one's easy because this is most of the book of Acts. And then God's grace. God ultimately is the one who brings his will to pass, and his will really isn't to be thwarted. We have the luck of being invited to be part of him bringing his kingdom to earth. Um, and all the things that look like failures, all the things that look like missteps, God brings that all together to bring it to pass. This is who recognizes this place. You've all been there, a bunch of you have been there. This is uh, the dome above the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem. So beautiful. I remember when I went down into the tomb there, you know, you all have your stories about going into the tomb. As I was going down in there, our tour guide was standing right outside the steps where you, you walk down into the tomb and he said, um, remember, he's not here. He's, he's not dead here. He's alive. And I was walking down in there with one of the women on our tour whose son had died in a plane accident when he was 16, you know, several years ago. And those words, you know, this whole trip, I was thinking about her son and walking down there and getting those words. Remember, he's, he's not here. He's alive. Um, her son is experiencing the resurrection as we all will. And that's finally the good news that we receive from Jesus. So the end of Acts is very interesting because it would be nice if Luke would have wrapped it up, said, and Paul went on and he, he talked to Caesar and this is what happened in Rome. And then he went and, and did ministry in Spain. And then he came back and was imprisoned again and was finally martyred. You know, it would be, I, I assume that Luke knew all that. He was alive during the history when it was happening. But Luke doesn't tell us any of that. He leaves it really open-ended and almost ending at the same place that we started. So Paul lived in Rome for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed everyone who came to see him. He announced the kingdom of God, which is exactly what Jesus does at the very beginning of his ministry in Mark chapter 1. He announces the kingdom of God and taught all things about the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, with all boldness, so courage and also willingness to speak in public about things that are important, with no one stopping him. And just kind of leaves us this question, well, what happened? What happened next? And from other historians, we get picture pieces of the picture of what happened next, but we sure don't get it in the book of Acts. And I think that uh, leaving the next steps of the story open is intentional because it makes room for us to step into the story. It makes room for us to become actors in the next step of God's vocation for the church. And so Paul's journey is at an end, but ours is just beginning. And next week, I love this suggestion of David Rowe. He suggests that we watch the two popes. We'll have to do it on our own during the week. 
Uh, I don't have Netflix, so I'm going to have to get a 30 day trial of Netflix. Um, but these, you know, two modern popes, how do they discern their vocation? They're so very different. How, how did that transition between the two popes happen? And, and how might that think about how we as Christians today, as Christians at St. Paul's and Murfreesboro, discern our vocation? So next week, we will take a look at this. Watch it before you come. I want to go back um, to this slide. So vocation, a matter of serendipity, of showing up, of community, of consistency, of failure, of God's grace. And we have four minutes before I'm going to cut out. Um, but I would just love to hear, like, which one of those seems to be touching in your life today? Where is God poking on or saying, you know, this, this is where your vocation is at work right now in one of these, um, one of these themes.